Welcome to the Thrive Master Show, where the focus is to reverse engineer action-taking impact makers. On this episode, we have Brian Bogert. Brian is a passionate human behavior and performance coach, speaker, business strategist, top sales professional, and philanthropic leader who believes in helping growth-minded individuals achieve the best version of themselves. Welcome to the Thrive Master Show, Brian. Hey, man, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. The focus of this show is to reverse engineer your journey. Uh, so let's get into it. Cool. Where do you want me to start, brother? Well, actually, um, the first question is, if you had to give a master class from your zone of genius, from all the wisdom you've acquired, what do you think it would be on? And if you have one, let's pitch it right now. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm a big believer in people becoming who they already are, their most authentic selves. And I'm a believer in them doing that through awareness and intentionality. That's the core of a lot of my one-to-one -one work. And that's also the core of the group coaching and the self-led course that we have that really helps guide people down that path. I think that that's people's superpower is to shed all the layers that the world is packed on top of them, funneling them into this tiny little journey on who the world told them they should be and really focusing on who they are, that's when magic happens and perspective, motivation, and direction really start to come to play. Wonderful. We'll get back to your zone of genius and what you're doing today in a second. Now let's go forward. Uh, the question that we're all going to face, and I'm talking about the end. I'm talking about death. Have you thought about it? Does it play a role in helping you navigate your life in some way? Yeah. And so I'm going to answer that question in a roundabout way. Cause I think I have a very, very healthy relationship with death. Um, so I want everybody just listening for a second, just to close your eyes for one second. I want you to imagine walking out of a store after a successful shopping trip and turning your head to see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you with no time to react. That's where this portion of my story begins. You see, we went to the closest store to pick up a one inch paintbrush. And as we were walking out of our store, I've always had an excitement and vigor for life. So of course I get to the car first. I'm waiting for my mom to unlock the doors and her and my brother are three, four feet behind me. And as this happens, a truck pulls up in front of the store parks and the driver and middle passenger get out. Passenger all the way to the right feels the truck moving backwards and he does what any one of us would do, right? He scoots over to put his foot on the brake, but he instead hits the gas. Combination of shock and force had him catapulting across the parking lot 40 miles an hour right at us with no time to react. Now we were in an end spot and so he went up and over the median in the end spot, went over and over the tree, hit our car and we think that I was holding onto the handle when this happened. So he, it threw me to the ground, truck ran over me diagonally, tore my spleen, left the tire track scar on my stomach and continued on to completely sever my left arm from my body. So it's 10 feet away from me, got reattached, had 24 surgeries, and I had a guardian angel that walked out of that store that same day. She saw the life and limb scenario over there. She saved my life by stopping the bleeding immediately. And she also saved my arm ultimately because she instructed innocent bystanders to run in, grab my arm, and put it on ice within minutes. Otherwise, I'd be sitting here today without an arm or potentially not even sitting here today. So she's responsible for my life and my limb and me being able to be a ha live a happy, healthy, and productive life. So I think having that happen early in life and many other experiences, I'm in the ICU, easy to feel sorry for yourself after something like that. And as I'm sitting there and the families are coming up to offer help and guidance and support and apologies for what had happened, come to find out their kids, many of them, are also in the ICU with terminal illnesses, not knowing whether or not they're gonna live for three more months. So the reality of it is, I have thought about death a lot in my life because I almost died at a very early age and I've had other experiences where I've had near death experiences throughout my life. And you know, I know a lot of people weren't expecting it to go there with that question, uh, but what I've realized is that we all have unique stories, right? And what's important is that we pause mm. and become intentional and aware with the lessons that we can extract from those stories and then intentional in how do we apply them in our lives. So. I say I have a healthy relationship with death because I think from a very early age, I've understood that it can happen that fast. And when it's our time, it's our time. It clearly wasn't my time then, right? And so that's why I'm now doing what I'm doing because I have the ability to be here happy, healthy, and productive and have an impact on other people's lives through the lessons I've extracted through my own stories. Wow, that's a powerful story, man. You really were up and close with it. Now, let's get back... Uh, in the opposite di direction. What was your earliest memory and how was your childhood in general? Um, I had a great childhood, but clearly it was significantly impacted based on what, what we just talked mm -hmm. about. That's um, right. You know, my earliest memory, I've got a couple of them, um, and they were all around the time that I was about age two. 
Um, I remember at the time I had a girlfriend and I told her that I was going to buy her a minivan. And this was during the height of minivan craze in the mid 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember back then telling her like we were going to get married and have a minivan. And I think I was two years old. Um, <laughs> and then obviously went on and moved on. But that was one of my very first memories. Uh, and so that's, that's just one I love to look back on because it makes me laugh. <laughs> wow. So that, that was a moment where you weren't going to have trouble with the ladies. You knew right well, there. <laughs> just because I told a two-year-old that I was going to buy her a minivan when I was two didn't mean I wouldn't have trouble with the ladies. It just, it just meant that I was going to go after it and hopefully, you know, buy love. Who knows? <laughs> That's right. And the other thought I had, wow, I have a minivan now and I have two kids and a third one on the way. So I never thought I would. <laughs> well, I, you know what? I never thought I'd own a minivan either other than that one time I told her I'd buy one. So, and we, we have not, but uh, congrats on the one on the way and your two existing kids. They're the greatest gift, man. Thank you very much. Okay, now going forward, uh, beyond the story that you shared, the success that you have now or where you are right now, was there a hint that you were gonna go in this direction from your, no, from your past? Not originally, to be honest. Uh, you know, I have a very unique story and I've never been shy. So I've been on stages telling my story since I was age seven. Um, but I never really thought about it in terms of what I could do from a business and what I could actually do to tap into that from a human behavior and performance standpoint. Uh, it was just always, right, I wanted to provide perspective, motivation, and direction into the world. And so I just did that. Uh, when I got out of school, I actually spent 15 years in risk management and employee benefits consulting. And, you know, one of the lessons I extracted from my early experience was this idea of embrace pain to avoid suffering. And we can talk about that later or not. But this is the yeah. same philosophy that we used for me to not only overcome this unique injury, but you know how my business partners and I built our insurance business from nothing to over 15 million in revenue within the span of a decade. And now how I've transitioned, transitioned that into helping hundreds of individuals and organizations, really just like you and our audience, get to the next level, get more clarity and become who they are. Um, so I did not have a glimmer. In fact, who put me on my path was, uh, was the first coach I hired six years ago. Uh, and within a month of working with him, he said, Brian, you gotta be doing this. And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, dude, you coach people naturally. You speak already. Like, this is what you're doing. Like, you could put this into a business, monetize it, and really have scale in the lives that you impact versus just the people in your life. And my immediate response was like, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm paying you a lot of money not to tell me how great I am, but tell me, figure out these <laughs> other things. Uh, but truth is, he told me something that I needed to hear instead of what I wanted to hear. And over the course of the next nine months, he continued to push me. And it was really just over five years ago that I launched my human behavior performance and speaking business. So did not have a glimmer early on. It was not a part of the plan, but I think sometimes our purpose in life finds us instead of us really having to go find it. Mm -hmm. Now on the topic of uh, mentors, coaches, how did you find yours? What are some of the tips that you have or did it just happen naturally for you? You know, I don't know that it's really ever happened naturally. I think in some cases it has. Um, I've, I've been blessed to have many, many mentors in my life. Um, and a lot of those were people that I seeked out. And I seeked mm -hmm. out to help close gaps in something that I had a, didn't have a skill set for or knowledge in. Um, and so not every single one was intentional, but I would say over my last, you know, 15 to 20 years, almost all of my mentors have been relatively intentional. Uh, the first coach that I hired, though, uh, was also extremely intentional, but I hired 15 before I hired my first one. And the first 14 just didn't have the relevance and credibility to really get me to where I wanted to go. And so I almost didn't hire a coach because I was like, what is this about? Like, <laughs> if, I've, if I've hired, if I've interviewed 14 people and none of them connect, like, when am I going to find that, that kind of silver bullet? And fortunately, I landed in a place where I found him and he's, he really helped me a lot. Um, and is the biggest reason that I'm doing what I'm doing today. Uh, so I'm forever indebted to him for, for that gift. And since then, I've had multiple other coaches in a formal capacity um, yes. and other mentors in a formal capacity. But I look at mentors and coaches, and I really take a step back and say, there is so much I don't know. In fact, I don't even know what I don't know. But when I can bring into my awareness what I don't know, there are many mm -hmm. experts in fields that I don't need to become the expert in. So I've hired nutrition coaches. I've hired Reiki energy healers. I've got a meditation coach. I've got a therapist. I've got a swim coach, a triathlon coach. I mean, <laughs> it, it, like the truth is, if, if you have a deficiency, if you don't have the skill set to get yourself somewhere, the quickest way to shorten the learning curve is hire an expert, right? We can put ourselves through an unnecessary amount of pain learning the process but the reality of it is we can learn the process, expedite that, that entire learning curve and have greater results faster with greater impact faster 
when we put the right people in our lives to help us get there. Now, you mentioned that you went through 14 interviews. Would you recommend people do that and, and, and just be, uh, have some set of questions and then just listen to their own gut or, or is there a the answer is the, the answer is I never would recommend to anybody to interview 15 people just for the sake of yeah. doing it. Yeah. But, but I would encourage people to interview somebody until they feel the relevance and credibility and for someone that resonates with them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I go right out of the gate with a lot of people who want to talk to me about coaching. And I fully accept and own the fact that I am not the right coach for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I have all the skill sets, even if my thought processes, even if what I'm going to do might be the best thing for them, if I don't connect with them, if, if it, whatever my experience is professionally, personally, isn't relevant and gives them credibility to help push them to the next level, then I'm not the right person. And so the reality of it is I do think that you're going to make a significant investment in yourself, not just with time, but with money, particularly for the right yes. coach. And so absolutely interview because you know there are a whole lot of things that sound great on the surface around coaches yes. and programs and different things but the reality of it is um you know there's not one person that can help you get there there's probably many people who can help you get there um and i'm not ignorant enough to expect that i can help everybody uh so yes interview until you feel the connection trust relevance and credibility from the person that's sitting across the table because if they haven't walked the way that you want to walk, if they don't help close a skill set or gap that you don't have, you know, if they're just going to be a peer along the way, do you need to pay them? Do they need to be your coach? Um, just look at it with really open eyes and understand what is the value of the investment I'm about to make and how is this person or this person's program or system or team going to help me get to where I want to go? Okay. So now I'm just trying to think like, how did you get to the mindset where you're open to learn from uh, coaches, mentors, because a lot of us go to school and, and we have teachers that are, you know, teaching us certain things. Was there a book? Was there a, a mentor or a leader before these coaches came into your life that put you on that track? Can you talk about that a little bit? You know, I, I don't know that there was a single person or a single book. I think it was a combination of experiences. Okay. Um, you know, and I, I, again, I don't mean to take it back to like a personal story, but I'm going to share one because I think it's relevant right now. Um, you know, the reality of it is, is I had a big period of my life after my accident um, where I didn't want to be the center of attention. I didn't want uh, to be a victim. I didn't want people to focus on me. And so what I did is I ultimately created a narrative and a belief system that I could do anything I wanted to do. I didn't need anybody's help. I didn't need, I didn't need the support of anybody in my life that I could figure it all out myself. I could, I could learn anything myself. I could get there myself. And it worked for a long time. And then all of a sudden I find myself 20 years old. And I, again, I've never really been affected or stopped myself from doing anything as a result of my injury, my arm or whatever. I was snowboarding and I went down and immediately when I hit the snow, I knew I broke my arm and I'm sitting there and I knew instantaneously that, that it was just there. And so I'll expedite this process, but I had a compound fracture to my left arm, same spot that it came off at. I almost lost it again when I was 20 years old. And I went through seven surgeons that were afraid to touch me because of the medical liability of going into an arm that didn't have normal anatomy, right? And so they tried all these different alternative procedures to heal me, of course, none of which worked because the anatomy on my arm was different. And so I went 10 months with my arm hanging by my side. And what I realized in that time is the world bought into the narrative that I'd created for myself. It wasn't that there weren't people in my life. It was that they didn't believe that I needed their help. And I wasn't in a position where I was vulnerable enough or secure enough in myself to actually ask for help. And so I went 10 months essentially by myself, re-experiencing a lot of things that I had a lot of support around me in when I was seven, eight, nine, 10 years old in my initial recovery. And I had to learn that. And so truthfully, I think it was that experience that was the biggest turning point for me in recognizing that I need a lot of help. And so after I got through that, after I started to heal from that physically, after I healed from that mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, which took a period of time and very intentional work, that whole next period of my life was really focused around vulnerability, authenticity, and how can I shorten the curve to learning? Well, if I'd learned anything in that moment, it was we all need a whole lot of help. I need a lot of help even at this point in my life. I still have coaches in my life and I coach professionally, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it was that moment realizing that when I put on the narrative that I didn't need help, 
I was isolated, I was alone, and I struggled more than I probably would have had my narrative or my confidence to ask for help been different. And so I just committed to myself at that moment, look, if I get stuck, if, I, if I'm blind to something, if I don't know where to go, ask for help, find a mentor, find a coach, find somebody who can teach me and just put myself in a position where, you know what, I don't know everything. I'm far from knowing everything. And so how can I learn from others and tap into the collective wisdom of our world? That's what this last period of my life has really been dedicated to. Now you had this moment of uh, being close to death and realizing that uh, maybe your ways of isolating and not asking for help. That was the story that was teaching people how to kind of treat you. Would you say looking into our own stories is a powerful place to start as far as uh, our, what our drivers are, what our, what our fuel is going forward? Like, would you, I wouldn't would you say it's just a powerful place to start. I think it's the only place to start. The reality of it is we all have unique stories, right? Like, yes, mine is very unique. Not a lot of people hear a story like mine, but I don't care if it's financial turmoil. I don't care if it's a rough upbringing. I, don't, I mean, I literally don't care what it is. The reality of it is we all have stories. We all have stories. We all have pain. We all have things that have knocked us on our butts in our lives. And what's important, like I said, is that we pause and become aware of the lessons yes. we can extract from those stories and then become intentional with how we apply them in our lives. One of the major lessons I learned early is not to get stuck by what has happened to me, but get moved by what I can do with it. That's the whole epitome of what I just said. If you can really become aware of what you can learn from each interaction, maybe you get fired from a job. Maybe you get dumped by a spouse or loved one. I mean, it literally, it doesn't matter because all of our experiences of pain and discomfort are different. It's independent based on the person that is, is, is experiencing it. And so the real important factor is how do you, slow down enough to not repeat the pattern, shorten the curve in the next time you encounter a similar experience. And then most importantly, once you can master that for yourself, how do you use your stories to help other people, right? You don't have to become a professional speaker or a professional coach to do that. We can all do that in our own worlds, our own lives, our families, our circles. And so the really important part is, is if we can help shorten the curve for someone else, that's the greatest gift we can give. Yes. Now, in a weird way, this, uh, the crazy time we're in, it, it's forced us all to kind of slow down and hit the stop. Yeah. And a lot of us have to re-examine. And so now where we are now, how are you dealing with the challenging time that we're in? Did you have to double down on something or pivot in a certain way yourself? Yeah, so I've absolutely pivoted. And the reality of it is you hit on something. We were all forced. I think, you know, we were all knocked out of autopilot, frankly. Right. I mean, when you think about it, like there were so many people who were being unconsciously led by the patterns in their lives. And all of a sudden when the world yes. shut down, right, they're having to relearn things and having some moments of awareness around like, oh, I don't really like my spouse or, oh, geez, I hate my job. Or like, like all these things that just exposed stuff that the unconscious patterned us into. And so we've all had to kind of take toll on those things. So for me in my business, it definitely had an impact. Um, and I did have to pivot. I will tell you the biggest thing that I pivoted on was I had a number of live stages get canceled right out of the gate. Things that we had signed contracts on, right? And clearly the world shut down. And so I, all the cancellation terms and all the stuff in the, in the contracts, I was just like, look, we're all good, right? Let me know if you guys wanna reschedule this thing. And so a little bit of lost revenue, but what that really also forced me to do pretty quickly was pivot to the virtual world. Cause I saw instantaneously that it was gonna change. And so mm -hmm. prior to COVID, I had probably only done somewhere between five and 10 podcasts, right? Okay. I'd never done a virtual summit. I'd never done a virtual keynote. I don't know that there was a lot of people that did either one of those two things because they weren't really even in existence back then. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I did, I mean, you complimented me on my studio, right? I invested to do a proper virtual studio setup that has a real live background, that has proper lighting, that has proper sound, you're sitting on a cart that's six feet in front of me that you're on a 50 inch television. So it looks like you're sitting across the table from me, right? The camera, the technology. I had to learn those things. I couldn't hire a contractor to come in my house and do it because we were all distant. Right. So I had to make myself smart on those things. But I think that that was one of the um, best decisions I made early was the, was the need to pivot and to put the proper technology in place, which has actually helped me win certain stages virtually in keynotes because I have the right technology and a good feel and setup. Now, this is probably evolution 6.0 of that in the last six months. I've tweaked it. I've changed lighting. I've changed <laughs> stuff. 
But now I feel like it's where it needs to be. And since COVID, I've probably done 60 podcasts. So prior to, I'd probably only done six and I've probably done 60 since then. And so I, I think it's really been a blessing in disguise for, for my business because I always thought about it truthfully in a very traditional linear sense. Like you get stages, it converts to coaching, coaching converts to stages. And I'm so right. eager for that human connection and energy exchange. Like that to me is my favorite place is to be on a live stage. I can't wait, frankly, until we get back. But the reality of it is, is, is until that happens, until that time comes, this is a great way to reach different audiences on a broader platform. And frankly, far outside of my own circles, right? This is a global opportunity with the way technology mm -hmm. accesses folks. And so that's been a real blessing in disguise for me. Um, coaching had to shift virtually, right? And so a lot of my clients that I would see in person or would fly in to visit with me or now all of a sudden, right, we're all virtual. And so it's changed things, but that's why you're on a big screen because I didn't like that I couldn't see the micro expressions as well on a small screen of a computer. I didn't like that I, you know, because so much of what I do has to do with emotional intelligence and reading. And so it took me a few iterations over the four, course of a couple of months to shift from a laptop to a slightly bigger monitor to now a full size screen where literally it looks like I'm sitting across the table from you. And so that has really helped close some of the technological gaps. Um, and it's all learning, right? So. Now, what are some of the virtual uh, seminars that you're doing or conferences coming up? Yeah, so I actually have a few next week. Um, I've got a, a, a Growth Stack Drive conference that Ken Jocelyn is hosting uh, next week. I've got um, a Growth Now movement with Justin Snack next Friday that I'm speaking at. Um, and then uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's from Employee to Entrepreneur with uh, Dr. Clarissa Castillo and uh, mm -hmm. share the stage with some phenomenal individuals on each one of those. So Jordan Harbinger and uh, Sharon Lecter and, and some folks. And so it's a really, all three of these platforms are actually all next week. So I'm looking forward to each one of them. Um, and so those are the most, most uh, up and coming ones, but there's a number of them booked out through the end of the year. Cool. So now you do the speaking, you're doing the coaching. Is that more one-on-one -on -one or is that group uh, sessions as well? Yep. So it's both. Um, I, I do primarily one, I mean, my work often is focused in the one-to-one -one category. Mm -hmm. um, but I, we did build out a group coaching platform specifically for the fact that there's a lot of people that don't have the time, energy, or money necessarily to invest in the full one-to-one -one coaching, or they're just not ready for it. And so the group coaching mm -hmm. gives some built-in accountability. And then we also have put a lot of our coaching philosophies into a digital course that's got a lot of video and written content to really be able to help people who want to just do it on a self-led basis and do yes. it on their own timeline to really be able to get these same concepts. And so I uh, those courses and the group coaching platform were in development for the better part of a year. We're set to go live anyway, right around the launch of COVID. And so that's actually been a real blessing as well because it's allowed us to reach more people. Okay, so those courses and the group sessions are more for people who are just getting into it. But if somebody wants to work one-on-one -on -one with you, who's your ideal client? Yeah, so most often I'm working with um, what I would define as already high performers. So executives, entrepreneurs, high-level salespeople, um, typically high level athletes at collegiate or professional level. Um, often it's people who've already made some element of money, but they're feeling stuck, stymied in their efforts to fulfill their potential, um, lacking clarity in certain areas. And so I really work with individuals to go deep on an intrinsic journey, get clarity and really maximize results personally, professionally, and in service to others um, so that they can get to their next level and live their best life, uh, make their best even better, frankly. Um, so that's typically who it is. But I would tell you that you know, any growth minded individual who really wants to go deep, even though that's the typical approach and structure. Yes. I've worked with individuals who are not any of that category, but they really are just looking to get clarity on who they are and where they want to head in their life. So I worked with a guy who worked in hospitality. He, he managed a couple of bars and mm -hmm. ultimately worked with him on a six month contract and he shifted his life completely. I mean, he invested a significant portion of his annual income but he's now living a happy, fun, fulfilled, joyous life because he got, his path, he got on the path to become an EMT and a firefighter. And what he really wanted to do was serve and save lives. So it's not always about monetary gain with my clients, right? Often it's actually about the softer skills and bringing more joy, freedom, and fulfillment back into their life. Wonderful. Last few questions. Uh, so you have Bogart's Bullets on, is that on <laughs> Facebook only? No, it's on Facebook, LinkedIn, and I've got a YouTube channel and that's where it actually started. I've just only recently started distributing those on all the LinkedIn or on all the social platforms. So 
Wonderful. I've been going over a few and I highly recommend you guys check it out as well. Let's go over a few. You said stop chasing a dream of work-life balance. What should we focus on instead? Yeah, I, I don't believe in work-life balance. I think it's a, it's a misnomer. It's a, we're setting ourselves up for failure. I believe in work-life integration. We've got one life. If we get really, really clear on what's important to us, if we understand the things that serve the greater path that we're on, the people that are important to us, then we can build a life of intentional alignment that really allows us to live with no limits. But it's an integrated approach and allows us to focus and be where our feet are right now, right? The reality of it is if we think about balance, right? There's just no way to dedicate the same amount of time, energy, and effort to everything that's important in our lives around people and business and community and hobbies and all those things. But if we recognize the things that all serve that greater path, then it's not looked at as taking away from another category because that ultimately means they're all supporting each other. And so I'm a big believer in integration versus balance. I just don't think balance exists. Now, as far as integration, uh, what would be the first step? Like, would it be to say, okay, this is important. That is important. Uh, making a list of that. Yeah, I think, I think getting clarity on the things that are most important to you, right? So, and, and really, what is it, where is it that you want to be at the end of your life? What legacy do you want to leave? What purpose do you have? Because I really think that that helps bring it all together. And then it helps you really intentionally structure like what are those things? So for me, my family, my wife, my two kids, they are hands down the most important thing to me. That does not mean that they get the greatest amount of my time. But when they get my time, right, I am 100% there and I am totally focused on what I'm doing for them. And it allows me to also look at when I'm focused on my own personal health, when I'm focused on developing my business and impacting the lives of others, when I'm focusing in the community, all of those things ultimately allow me to be there with my family and to be able to also have the financial freedom to be able to support them, allow them to do the things that they want to do. Um, but again, supporting them financially means nothing if I'm not ever active and present. And so I have very intentional time every single day built in with each one of my three family members. And we have regular trips where we get away where I'm 100% dedicated and focused on them. My phone stays in a drawer somewhere because they are what's most important to me. They are my legacy. My profession, frankly, is something that I'm allowed to do because my family gives me the freedom and support to do it. And so I look at that, I think getting clear on what's important in all categories of your life. Where do you really want to go? What are your goals? The reality of it is in some people, they're happy making 30 or $40,000 a year. There's nothing wrong with that. Like mm -hmm. none. And if anybody tells you that it is, if you've got everything else set up in alignment in your life and you are doing the things that you want to enjoy, I think people focus often on success as financial. And yes, that's a part of it because money allows you to do certain things, but not everybody has the desire to do all things that cost money, right? So I think it's about getting clarity on those things because if you set up your life in alignment, the one client I referenced before, for him, it wasn't about going and building a massive business. It was about serving and helping people, right? So he's got more joy, freedom, and fulfillment in his life because now it's not about work-life balance. He gets to commit all of himself to every area of his life. And because he's removed the drain of the profession that he didn't like, he has more energy to do everything else. Yes. Wonderful. Last question. This is about looking forward. Uh, next decade, uh, five years, I don't know how you dream. Is there a vision for you going forward and your family? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to speak about the business first because I think it's bigger than five or 10 years. This I'm going to have to commit the rest of my life to. So over the next 25 to 30 years, I want to impact a billion people in this world. And what I want to impact them to do is to become who they already are, their most authentic selves. And that means bringing joy, freedom, and fulfillment back into their world by allowing them to do that. So that is my driving force in everything I touch right now from a professional standpoint. Um, for my family, right, it's about creating those moments of joy, freedom, and fulfillment with them, right? We're getting ready to go on a trip for fall break and do things that we really enjoy, and I'll be 100% shut off and focused on them. Um, my biggest goal for my family, I've got a six-year-old and a five-year-old. So when I look at this, I've got 12 to 13 years left with my kids in yeah. the house. And so a lot of my focus right now is really to give them the tools to be successful and allow them to flourish into who they already are. Um, I think my wife and I are really blessed in that we see the gifts that our children are to this world. And so we don't want anything or anyone to, to impact that in a negative way. We don't wanna take that light out of them. We wanna help that light shine. So I have a really heavy focus to fulfill what I want to do for the entire world, starting with my kids. And so that's really where that is. The family is number one. And then if I can continue to do this on the professional front, like I said, man, I'm hoping to impact a billion people over the next 25 to 30 years. 
I saw a really cool video of you uh, mentioning with your kids the I am phrases. Uh, oh, can you just yeah. go briefly how important that is? Just yeah, so I, I think the two most important words in the English language are I am because the words that follow I am follow you, right? And so I think this is really, really important in a vision for not only who we are today, but who we want to become. And so I think that I am statements allow us to frame those things, right? One of the most famous I am statements is from Muhammad Ali. He said, I am the greatest. And, you know, reporters asked him early in his career, why do you say that? Why did you say I am the greatest? And he said, well, I started saying it early and often, long before I believed it and long before the world ever knew who I was. But I figured if I said it early enough and often enough that I would soon become it and the world would soon recognize it. Right. And so I work with my kids on doing I am statements. And we've got some that we say every single day before school. And we have ones to just help my kids reframe things. And so one of my favorite ones, this is, this is my own, but I say I am the manifestation of my thoughts. Because it really allows me to understand that what I vision, what I think about, what I, what I believe, positive or negative, is what I become, right? And so I think about this all the time. And I, my kids started saying that right after the time they were, were uh, speaking. But obviously, they're not as quite articulate. And manifestation is a pretty big word. And so my son, for a long time, used to say, I am the man of the station. He couldn't say <laughs> the whole word. And I was like, yeah, man, I like that. You are the man of the station of your thoughts. So yeah, it's something I've done with my kids for a long time. It's, I think it's really, really important. Wonderful, Brian. This has been really inspiring. Uh, where can people find more information about you and where can they follow you? Yeah. So um, I'm at Bogart Brian on pretty much all the social media profiles. Uh, a great place where everything comes together is my website at brianbogert.com. Um, and then I actually have a free gift for everybody that's listening as well. A lot of the concepts that we talked about on getting clarity, understanding how to build your life of alignment, our coaching philosophies, we've really pared down into a kind of a cheat sheet to give you a quick start into what that is. And so that's at nolimitsprelude.com. And so for anybody who thinks they're really clear on who they are, people who have no idea where to start, or those that are somewhere in between, this will be a really effective resource for you and totally free, so. Wonderful, I'm gonna check that out and I recommend everybody checking that out. Brian, thank you very much again. Thank you, brother, I appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you and your audience.